Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Peter Lindstrom, and I will call the Environment uh, Committee to order here for the Met Council. Welcome to the to the committee. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Is, um, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Second. All right. All in favor say yes. Yes. Aye. Opposed, not, nay or no? I'll take any one. Okay, it's approved. Uh, that takes us to the minutes. Any uh, changes to the minutes today? Look good. Um, Move approval is there a the motion to approve? Okay, I heard a motion and a second. Second. There we go. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay? Carries. And that takes us uh, through our business agenda. We don't have anything, any new business today. But we have a, a very exciting um, few items under our information, uh, part of our agenda, including number one, the 2018 Better Government Award. Let's hear all about this. This, this sounds exciting. Very exciting. Good afternoon, Chair and Committee members. Good afternoon. My name is Karen Neese, Director of Administration for Environmental Services. And this is Jennifer Zuhowski. She's Manager of Programs and Administration for Environmental Services. So in 2018, um, December of 2018, we received a Better Government Award from the state of Minnesota. And a little bit of the history about this award, it was started in 2010 by Governor Dayton. And it was a way to celebrate state employees and Met Council employees, um, our work accomplishments that have increased efficiency and effectiveness. Last year, a total of 34 projects were nominated, and MCES won, was the only awardee in the category of Great Place to Work. Um, and I, what I'll do is have Jen talk about why we won the award, and then we'll have a couple of um, new empl newer employees that benefited from the work that we did that won us the award. So I'll let Jen take away. Okay, so in terms of um, what constituted the uh, great place to work was the fact that we expanded our, our recruitment and retention efforts to reach more diverse populations, particularly um, so that our workforce would better reflect the workforce of the region. Um, and we um, did that through building relationships with community organizations, um, building STEM curriculum with teachers in the area. We also um, brought students to our metro, metro plant, our, our largest plant, to um, do tours of the facility, but also to meet with ES employees and learn about the jobs. Um, we also um, included some transit and some other um, divisions as well as students had interest in um, law enforcement or legal um, planning. So we did some as a joint effort and uh, we hosted some job shadowing initiatives, but basically being very visible and open in the community to um, build that relationship. In terms of um, our employee recognition program, and, um, we recognized how important employee engagement is and part of that is recognizing um, the behavior that aligns with our mission, vision, values, and goals. And so we um, got a group of employees together to revamp our um, employee recognition program. And so our new program um, encompasses a peer-to-peer -peer, um, aspect. And then there's also our Keystone Award. And we've seen um, substantial increase in the number of awards given since the um, uh, new program was implemented. And in fact, just before this meeting, I was sitting on the uh, uh, panel to evaluate a Keystone Award that had been um, presented before the group. So, um, and what better way to um, talk about the good program um, other than hearing testimonies from people who've experienced our outreach and have um, and in fact, join our organization, and they actually encourage other people to um, come work for ES as well. So, first, I'd like to bring up Juan Barry. Good evening, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, Juan Barry, uh, I started with uh, uh, Environmental Services in January of 2018. Um, 
I first um, heard about the job through uh, one of my good friends, um, Marcus, uh, excuse me, Russell Mitchell. Uh, he works for um, environmental services, labor and industry. Um, he's a job and outreach uh, person himself. And he contacted me with uh, Metro. Um, from there, um, we talked about longevity. I worked with a different company that did sewer work, um, um, but I didn't see longevity in work with that company. Uh, even though I was with them for 12 years, it was getting more and more difficult with, um, uh, with my age, um, with the labor intense work. Um, so I was trying to seek other employment that would um, give me longevity to my retirement. Uh, which Metro Council Environmental Services matched up perfectly for me. Um, so after um, three interviews with Metro Council, um, which was great because it gave me more confidence that they're serious about uh, hiring mm. good, stable people that works out for, would work out for me and work out for them. Um, so I guess at the end of the day, um, word of mouth is since I've been here for a year, I know the job. Um, it's a good job. It's a job that I feel confident that I can stay until, until I want to leave and now be forced out or anything like that. Um, so <clears throat> word of mouth is important to me and to get more people of not necessarily color, um, but my stature, I'm 48 years old. So that can become a, a slippery slope uh, for some people when when they reach my age and trying to find good employment, I uh, still have 10, 20 years left of the work. So um, that's really all I have to. What is it that you do for environmental services, Mr. Uh, Barry? Interceptor um, services um, at regional. So we um, check the pumps and on a daily basis, we make sure that the pumps are clean and it's getting fairly um, I wouldn't say clean water, but water without no debris and stuff in it, so the pumps work, work for efficiency. Fantastic. That's an important job. Those pumps aren't working, then you have uh, that water's not flowing, exactly. and it's maybe flowing backwards, <laughs> right. and bad things happen when uh, when that happens. Exactly. I don't know a lot about this, but uh, no, I'm new on the job, but I know that's bad, so keep up the good work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and Gabriel Rios. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. I'm Gabriel Rios. I work also with Interceptor Services. I work out of West Regional, out of Mound. And um, I'm also, I started working here about a year ago. Actually, today's my first year anniversary. Oh. Congratulations. <laughs> You didn't bring the cupcake? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I, I started working, I started hearing about uh, uh, MCES through a, a friend of mine that works with American Indian uh, YC down by Franklin. And uh, I was talking to him about it and he said, you should apply. And that's how it starts. And the way he, from what I get, from what he heard it from was just through flyers, mm -hmm. through just a simple flyer that from FT, uh, from Web, Web Council that they were looking for people, you know, and they were trying to strive for minorities. And, and I think that's very important for us as far as trying to recruit, because I'm in the equity committee too now, mm -hmm. and within a year, I, I, that's one of the strongest things that I believe in that they helped me get here. And I don't think it stops there. Mm -hmm. You know, I got to go out to my community and let them know that this is a good place to work, you know, and that, that's, that's why it's so important for, I'm glad they invited me here for, for people to know that make those decisions that, it's it's very it's very vital for us to be out in the community and let them know all the way from even just going to a uh, even a, 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 a committee event to where we put a booth out like Cinco de Mayo or things like that that we have to be visible for the community for them to see us. One of the things that that I, I had a strike in my past is that I was I, I did some uh, prison time and I've, I've been I was. I'm an ex-felon. I'm not a felon anymore because I don't <laughs> not commit any more crimes. But the bottom line is, I've changed my life around. And and that's just it. Guys, is here. It says, what does this job mean to me? It's, it it means more than than just a job because now it's there's trust. 
you know, I, I build the trust with my, my coworkers, and that's something that I know. That, again, if I go out to the community, I got the trust of my of my coworkers behind me now, knowing that okay, you know, the first thing that they, they, people hire, they think of hiring a felon is okay. Is he going to kill anybody? Is it murder? You know, it's kind of you know, it's it's curiosity, you know. So it's part of you know life, and uh, but but that's the kind of things that. That uh, that this job means to me is that they, they gave me that trust, and, and now when I go to work, I go to work with pride, you know. And I can go up there with the lift station. I work with the lift station, and we have we have a job to do, and we all do it. But at the end of the day, we come back to the state to the thing, and we're we're friends, you know. Most of them, of course, there'll be some guys that are you know, out of whack, but that's that's, <laughs> that's part of it, you know, everybody's society, and and I'm not saying in a dangerous way, but but it's just something that we have to you have to learn how to deal with people with diversity, you know, and that's one thing that 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 I know that I can bring back, not not just to my community, back to the shop, you know, because what I experienced going through prison is I've, I've lived through I went through seven years and I lived through everything with, with every single diverse situation. I, I, I was rooming with the Catholic to all the way to a rabbi, you know, any situation I've, 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 I've been through it. And, and that's taught me a lot now to see when I came out now, it's a different world. And that's what, that, that's what MCA means so much to me is that from what, what I've gathered from the equity committee, we want to go out and recruit. You know, I, I could have kept this a secret and nobody would have known I, I'm, I'm my coworkers. And, I, and, I, and when I first started, you know, I worked for uh, MnDOT, for the city of Minneapolis. So since I've been out, I've been doing good things. So when I, people say they don't hire you because because you're a felony, I don't believe that. I believe that if somebody sells, really sells themselves, and that's where we got to go show our community. We got to go show them that you know how, you got to be able to to sell yourself to somebody in front of you for them to hire you. If you go up there with a negative attitude, of course they're not gonna. You know, it's like any any other job. So, but, but that's what, what what this means to me. Is that it's, it's part of the, the again yeah, going back to the community? I, I always go back to that because that's where the family is. That's where the finance. It's all about it's about economics. You know, we got to be able to support our families. And there's people out there that I know that are, that are qualified at the job from the people that they've hired, including me. That that, that they're trainable. So it's, it's not it's not about people can't do the job. It's part of always being inclusive. Of, of make sure the managers know that okay, you know we got to think out of the box. You know, if, if you have some kind of prejudice or, or some back in your mind you know, that you grew up with, you got to learn how to think out of the box, be open minded, <laughs> and that's the only way that you'll be able to to include people from other communities. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Excellent. Any questions? And, and like I tell anybody too, because in my situation, like I said being uh, coming out of prison. I even tell everybody, in my, anybody, if you have any questions about it, just let me know. I mean, I'm, I'm really open about it. I'm, I won't be trying to hide away. I hope they will ask me this. Any questions, <laughs> open. The equity committee here, anywhere. I appreciate that. In fact, uh, as you were speaking, and, and Mr. Barry, as you were speaking, I was reminded that uh, every once in a while there's um, – uh, the Met Council does these short videos on various aspects of the Met Council, and I thought, wow, listening to, to the two of you, wow, what amazing stories uh, and experiences that you both bring. Um, so hopefully there's someone from communications that's uh, <laughs> dialing in here, and uh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. So there you go. Because I, I'm, I would have been here a year, so I, I'm always, always – People think, I told people I don't like attention. That's why I had my own TV show, radio. And all. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's, that's part of the thing is I, I'm, out, I'm an outgoing person. I like, want to know people because I got other skills too that I could use. But, but, uh, I'm, I'm mentoring and, and with the mentor work, mentoring works, mm. and that's an awesome program too. So now you might be seeing me walking on the halls and upstairs. So I love it. And don't I, be surprised if there's a video camera following you around uh, in the, I got in the near home, future, so. too. I got two of them at home, so that's no problem. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, thank you for let, letting us tout our good work. And we have an equity change team. We have some members here in um, the audience that are active participants on that team. And... Uh, We'll continue to do this work. We'll continue with our outreach efforts and looking for opportunities to 
increase the diversity of our staff and to reduce barriers to application and just be an all-around all more inclusive environment. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And go forth and prosper. This is so <laughs> important. Uh, and the council uh, fully supports it 110%. Thanks again. And uh, with that, that takes us to our next information items, which is NCES Finance Overview. Ned and Kyle, welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Ned Smith. And I am the Director of ES Finance and Revenue. And on my right is? Kyle Colvin, Manager of the Engineering Programs Group and Tech Services. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, and Wendy, my gosh. <laughs> You're hardcore if you're here. Um, thank you for the opportunity to um, yeah, I've come. never seen this before. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but you have. Uh, to come and talk through this. What we wanted to do was give you a very high level overview of how finance works at MCS. It's kind of a finance 101, budgeting 101. Um, and the way I'm gonna do it is I'm gonna take the 2019 budget presentation and not really talk through the specific numbers, but more about what these numbers mean about how we manage our finances here at MCES. Um, and then if there's time, I'd like to go through all the subsets of GASB 75, because there's some really great uh, things in there that are very exciting. I'm just <laughs> Actually, it is fun. Anyway, I'll cover that another time. <laughs> um, first, uh, this is a slide that we always use whenever we go out into the public, just to remind people who we are and what we do. Um, so hopefully by now you've seen this a few times, um, but the most important things uh, is, is it's really small print. Um, we are, seven counties, the metro area, uh, we have 110 communities that we serve um, and 2.7 million people plus or minus. Um, and then our facilities, eight wastewater treatment plants. Those are very capital intensive businesses. They're very expensive to run and maintain. 600 and 10 miles of pipe, same story there. Those are very expensive and we do a lot to maintain those from a, both a, a annual maintenance as well as a capital. And then we serve about 250 million gallons a day. Um, we have over 600 employees and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but these last two numbers are the key ones from a finance perspective. So the total value is estimated or replacement value, depends on how you think about it, uh, is about 7 billion. Um, the way we got that is we actually have records of every dollar we've invested since the 40s, I believe, and we've used um, contractor or construction multipliers to come up with what that number is, $7 billion replacement value. Um, and that costs money, so we do about $150 million, uh, per year in capital rehabilitation. So if you divide $150 into $7 billion, you get about uh, a 50-year cycle. So it's about 2%. So every 50 years, we're completely cycling through the system, which is about right. Some things last longer, some things almost 100 to 150 years, some things only last 10 or 20 years. Um, Janine Clancy, our AGM of technical services, will walk through a lot more of the details of the, tech, of the capital program in the coming weeks. Um, but it's just important to keep those dollars out there. So um, the important thing here to know, generally we're about a $300 million agency. Um, but the first and foremost thing that we like to emphasize is that we are a fee-for-service agency. So I like to tell people, you flush, you pay. You don't flush, you don't pay. Um, however, we are a wholesaler, so we sell to the cities, and then the cities turn around and, and pass that fee on to their customers. Um, but we are 100% fee-for-service. We do not receive any state, federal, or council money to run our business. Um, so that includes operation, maintenance, and rehabilitation of our system is all paid for with user fees. Um, likewise, we cannot use any of our fees for other council operations. So we have had um, certain people complain that SAC is a, is a scheme to pay for light rail. Absolutely not. SAC is a scheme to pay our debt service on our pipes. And it's not a scheme. <laughs> um, it's pretty pretty thought through, and we'll cover that uh, in a, in a little bit as well. Um, and so that's the and the other thing to notice from this is that the bulk of our revenue does indeed come from our what we call municipal wastewater charges, and those are the wholesale fees that we charge to the cities. And Kyle's going to walk through how we get to that dollar in a little bit. Um, but again, it's important to note three quarters of our money does come from our, what we call MWCs, 
Um, the other big chunk there is sewer availability charge at 15%. So that is a, that is a, that's a basically our one-time connection fee uh, to, if you connect or expand your use of the system. And I'll walk through a little bit more detail what, those, what that means. But uh, either way, a material revenue source. And then we have our industrial waste charges, which we actually charge directly to our industrial customers. Those are for the customers that have process flows or factories um, that are putting additional uh, strength or other pollute, um, other nutrients in the system that is more expensive to uh, treat than normal domestic waste. And Mr. Smith, is there a threshold there? If you're uh, over a certain size, how, then you have to pay these indu industrial fees? How, how does that work? Yes. So uh, we have an entire industrial waste team. So that's headed by Bob Nordquist under Larry Rogacki and Support Services. Um, and, oh gosh, they probably have 20 or 30 uh, engineers that work with our industrial customers that do sampling of their outflows. And it is, it's, there's, a, there's a cutoff of the strength of your discharge. Um, and I can't think of the number off the top. Off, it has something to do with mega per liter. I, it's, you, you lost me already. Exactly. So that's good. So it's a strength. So <laughs> you answered the question. There's, we a, use, there's a threshold. Yes. And we use domestic as a, as a benchmark. So what normally comes out of a household, if you're putting in something that's stronger than that, then we'll put you, it's being called on permit. And once you're on permit, then we monitor those and bill. Um, so those are the most important things to know for our revenue. Um, the other thing to know about our revenue and about our overall budgeting process. So you'll see that last year. Excuse me one second. Uh, yes. Council Member Wolf. Before we get off the industrial strength charges, I just wanted to, to mention that we did a really cool thing because we have so many breweries now, all these little micro breweries. Yeah. And their waste is very high strength. But instead of monitoring each and every brewery all over the region, they worked with a couple of breweries to get an idea per barrel that you brew how, what sort of nastiness comes down the pipe and so they could figure out per barrel what we could charge so we don't have to monitor each of those breweries and keep adjusting them all the time. So it makes it easier for them because they know up front this is what it's going to cost you and it makes it easier for us because we don't have to be pestering all the time to see how they're doing with their breweries. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you. So glad you're here. <laughs> Um, so from, from last year, we had a 3.5% municipal wastewater charge increase. So that was that 77%. Um, and what's important to note about that is we have made our a commitment to our customers that we're not going to increase that by more than 4% for the next, well, uh, 2019 was year two of a five-year commitment. And after that, we've promised to keep it in line with um, inflation. And we sometimes get pushback, especially from our operations folks saying, well, you know, because uh, back in 2016 and 2017, we raised the rates at around 5%. And there was no revolution that we knew of. Um, and so we'll, the, we will get concerned from our operations folks. Well, geez, you did it then. Why can't you keep doing 5%? Mm. And the answer is because um, we do have, by, authority, by statute, we have unlimited rating authority. We could raise it 100% if we want it. Um, that wouldn't be wise because the problem is you don't know your customers are upset until it's too late. And they do, when they do get upset with how you're running your business, they don't call you and tell you, they call their legislator and they ask for a law to change how you're being run. Um, and so we want to stay ahead of that and we want to make sure that we're providing value to, to our customers and that we are being good stewards of the rate payer dollars. Um, and one of those is by making sure that we are keeping our rate increase below 4%. Um, the other thing to note here is on uses, you'll see that our revenue went up 3.5%, but our use went up 6.1%. Some of that was passed through grants, which means we get a dollar of revenue and per dollar of expense um, for things like inflow and infiltration and other uh, programs. So the actual increase was 4.7%, but again, math savvy in the crowd will notice that that's mean that would imply that we are operating in a deficit and that's true uh, in some years we choose to operate at a deficit particularly if it's the year after we have had a surplus in our operations so if we have collected more money than we have spent we have a surplus we believe we should we should return that money back to our customers and the way we do that is through what we call rate relief by operating 
purposely at a deficit. Um, so that's a lever that we use to keep, um, and in fact, that's a lever we use then to keep us below 4%. So we might look across the entire business and say, gosh, it looks like we need to go up by 5% or else, well, it looks like we need to go up 5% and we can say, that's fine, we will. We will cover the difference to get us back down to a 4% rate increase by using our reserve. Um, and our reserve right now is very healthy. Uh, our reserve has to be 10% uh, of our operating expense, of our pure operating expense, less debt service, which is about 12 million. Um, for 2018, or 14 million, excuse me. Well, it depends on the year. Uh, but for 2018, uh, our reserve is projected to be at about 37 million. So we have some room in the reserve, uh, and we will, as we look ahead to 2020, we are also anticipating that we will plan at a deficit, and we'll use some of our reserve funds uh, to to cover that. And you may be getting to this, but uh, tell me about bond rating, because I know the amount of reserves are critical yes. to what rating you actually receive yes, from the agencies. Will, we will get to that. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to uh, now turn it over to Kyle, and he's going to walk us through how we take a 3.5% municipal wastewater charge increase and allocate that out to our customers. Right. <clears throat> and the first important uh, takeaway here is that the 3.5% uh, increase in our regional municipal wastewater budget does not translate automatically to a 3.5% increase to all of the communities that are served through the system. Uh, there's primarily three factors that actually come into play that influences a community's uh, municipal wastewater charge. Uh, that's the, the flow that's generated, the volume of flow that's generated by the community itself. Uh, the total regional flow, and then obviously the, the budget that we establish uh, up front. And of those three factors, really the, the regional municipal uh, wastewater charge budget uh, has uh, the least impact. Um, we, what the council does is it takes um, flow data, uh, volume of flow, that's calculated from one year, and then uses that two years after the fact to allocate the regional municipal wastewater charge, and we're going to call it the regional MWC from here on. Um, so for instance, for the 2019 bills, the bills that communities are paying this year, we used flow data from 2017. Uh, this, uh, the council uses, uh, in order to uh, allocate uh, the costs, the council uses a proportionality model. Um, it takes the volume that the community generates and divides that by the total regional flow. So there's a percentage. There's a percentage that uh, represents a community's contribution to the total regional flow. And then that percentage then gets applied to the uh, uh, regional wastewater uh, uh, budget. So for instance, if a community generated 10% of the regional flow, then 10% of the total regional uh, wastewater charge budget gets applied uh, for that community. Uh, and then uh, that bill then gets billed to each community equally over 12 monthly uh, invoices. Um, on here, we've got just some examples of uh, real, uh, real examples of uh, what, uh, what we saw between 2018 and 2019. So for instance, for the for the uh, regional municipal wastewater charge, uh, we had a three and a half percent increase that uh, had alluded to. Uh, we also, for those two years, we had a total regional flow that increased a little or decreased a little less than one percent. So it went from 90.7 billion gallons to uh, 98 billion gallons uh, regionally. So. Uh, the uh, municipal wastewater budget went up 3.5%, but the regional flow went down 0.8%. Uh, so from a, on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis, we have three examples here that kind of represents how a community's flow can be impacted by their, by their community flow. So for instance, for City A, this is a, an example where community's flow stays the same under the scenario from one year to the other. Uh, that would represent an increase in that community's bill of 4.4%. And that's reflective of the fact that the total regional flow went down a little bit. So if you will, I like to use the analogy of a 
pie. The mm-hmm. size of the pie kind of went down a little bit, but their slice stayed the same for one from one year to the other. So uh, the cost of that slice, if you will, actually went up to 4.4%. Another example is that we can have a community's mm-hmm. flow can a- that can actually go down, but because of their flow reduction was less than the you know 0.1% went down less than what the total regional flow went down, they're actually picking up a bigger share of the pie, if you will. So their net result was about a 2.3% increase. And then just lastly, just kind of straightforward here, we have a community whose flow increased 1%. Uh, if you take into account that the regional flow went down about a percent, but you had a three and a half percent increase in the cost, then that resulted in an increase to the community's uh, uh, cost of uh, close to 9%. So uh, even though the, um, the proportionality uh, model that was implemented in 2005, prior to that uh, time, we established a rate up front, had a, uh, had a, uh, a need, a regional MWC need, and then we would go through the year, and depending on whether we had a wet year or dry year, we could end up with a negative positive variance. And so in cases where we had a negative variance then in the budget, then we would have to then increase races. So pri- uh, uh, rates. So prior to 2005, we could see communities' costs really swing widely. So uh, this here, this proportionality model is a model that uh, in the last 10 to 15 years have, has been adopted by other wastewater utilities. Um, I think we were probably one of the first adopters of this methodology, but we're seeing uh, a lot of other uh, wastewater utilities adopting this type of methodology because it guarantees that they're going to they're gonna collect the revenue that matches the budget forecast. So there, there's generally two components that go into uh, uh, calculating or determining the flow, the flow allocation uh, for communities. Um, one is metered flow. Uh, the system, we currently have over 220 dedicated permanent billing meters uh, in the region. Uh, these meters collect flow around the clock 24 uh, 7. the collection of the data varies in frequency on the site but those that data gets rolled up into 15 minute and daily totals and then of course gets totaled for for the year uh, it's important to note that out of the 110 communities that we will bill in next year in 2020 only 36 of those communities are at, their flow is actually based entirely on meter flow the rest of the communities, uh, 70, uh, 74 communities, have either a combination of uh, flows that are metered and, and we meter uh, flow that comes into the community and out of the community. And of course, the net is, is what's being generated within the community. And then we also have, in many cases, uh, areas of one community that serve through another community. I think this was a slide that uh, you saw during a committee of the whole meeting. And so this is part of a comprehensive plan requirement that they report these number of connections. So uh, in addition to the metered calculations, we have to make these offline unmetered corrections uh, between between communities. Uh, not every inner community service gets adjusted by us. There's inner community agreements that stipulate and many times the communities can work out uh, the exchange and the, uh, the balance adjustment of these flows, but in many cases uh, they rely on the council to to make these adjustments. And this, in terms of the flow allocation process, this is the most time consuming part of flow allocation calculations. This, this takes uh, anywhere from three to five weeks to complete. And uh, we do rely on information from communities um, that, uh, that uh, consist of connection counts, water use records, lift station data, a whole sundry of information that's usually agreed to, in most cases agreed to by the communities are that are being impacted by these adjustments. So each community is aware, is aware of how these adjustments are being made and that they are being made by the council. Mr. Chair. I would, council member. I would imagine that the meter probably set some records in the vicinity of U.S. Bank last night at about 1040. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mr. Chair, um, council member Vento, uh, you would 
think so, but actually, um, in the Super Bowl was in, we actually um, monitored, kept track of the flows, and surprisingly enough, it was detectable, but it wasn't as it wasn't as much as one would assume coming out of the downtown Minneapolis area. Interesting. It's just the, it's the scale. Yeah. So interesting. And then uh, just to kind of wrap up here, I think in your packet. Uh, there's a copy, uh, an example of the municipal wastewater charge uh, 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 information sheet that we send out to communities. This is a more up-to-date version of what's on the slide, and it basically just identifies the things that I, uh, uh, communities flow from one year to the other, that their percentage of the total regional flow, uh, the cost uh, that, uh, that they uh, can expect uh, for the upcoming year. This information is made available to communities in May, which is uh, around the time that communities are trying to establish their budget. So we want to make sure that they're aware of what the anticipated uh, Met Council uh, cost will be for a wastewater service, because in many cases, this, this charge, this cost, represents a, a significant portion of the community's operating budget. So it's important that we get this information out to them early. Then on the back side of this is probably uh, also, just as important, it identifies those areas within the community that we are making correction to, corrections for and those that we are not, so that the local community can be assured that we're making the corrections where we need to. Thank you, Kyle. Um, the other thing I will say about the allocation method is that uh, cities generally like this approach. Um, one and first and foremost is because of the budget certainty. So there was a time when we based it on flow. So if it rained a lot in a given year, we would bill them more in that year that as it happened. And if it didn't rain, then they wouldn't get billed as much. We didn't like that because then we still have pretty much the same operating expenses. But if the flow drops by 10%, our revenue used to drop by 10%. So this is good for both us and the cities because it does provide that budget certainty. Um, and again, as Kyle mentioned, it's eight months in advance. So that city will now know starting January 1 what their next 12 what their 12 months of billing is going to be um, there are some smaller cities that struggle a little bit with that the smaller cities can sometimes get whipsawed and so we might only have a 3.5 percent increase and we go yay for us and they might get a 19 or a 20 percent increase now some of that can be because of growth um, but some of it can be because of the I and I fluctuations that happen in their city relative to the broader um, panel. Uh, if you get those calls, um, of course, send them to me. Um, but you, what, if you do send them to me, one of the first things I do is I look up their history and I'll look at what happened two, three, four years ago. Because typically if you have a 20% increase this year, then within the last five years, you probably had a single year or even double digit decrease. And somehow they don't call me when that happens. <laughs> I don't call you either. Um, we have spoken to our customers in the past. Do they want us to try to manage that whipsaw? Do they want us to try to put some bumpers? Um, and the general feedback we have gotten is they would like it on the upper end, but they don't want it on the lower end. And so what the cities tell us is uh, they you, when their rates drop, they'll keep the rates the same. And they just pay us less and they use that to build their reserve. So that becomes a tool for them to manage their reserve. And so what they've told us is let, let me manage my own reserve says Mr. City or Miss City. So uh, we have not really done much to change that process. I think we always need to look at it to make sure that, that again, if there's somebody up 20 or 30 percent, is there some, somehow we can help that. But um, for right now, we are, we are continuing with that. And that also helps, those, that volatility also helps, or lack of volatility also helps our bond rating, which we'll get to soon. In terms of expenses, um, you can see that our biggest chunk is our debt service. It's at about 46%. Um, our debt service, we are in right now what we call a debt, debt bubble. Um, during the recession, when uh, revenues were down, especially for SAC, because there wasn't much development happening, um, we were looking for ways to keep our rates low. And one of the ways we did that was um, by what they call debt smoothing. But it was gen generally pushing the principal payments out into the future. And it's now been 10 or 15 years, and those principal payments are coming due. So for the next three to five years, our debt service is, is it's generally 130 to 140 million a year, but it's going up between five and nine million per year, which is um, a pretty big chunk, which also is a challenge in our 4% uh, rate increase promise. 
Um, but that bubble is going to end around 2022 or 2023. Um, and so that debt service as a percent of our budget should start to come down. Um, the bond rating agencies don't like to see it much above 50%. Um, I think we're going to hit 50% in around the 2022 timeframe. Um, but then from then on, it should start to, to trickle back down. And that's a story that if you tell the bond rating agency that, then that will be helpful. Um, the second biggest expense is our salaries and benefits. That's at about 22%. Um, that, uh, we have about 650 FTEs, uh, full-time equivalents across the, the, the utility. That number varies widely in terms, if you actually walked around and counted heartbeats, that number varies widely because we do have a lot, uh, or some, it's actually decreasing attrition through retirements um, and other natural churn. Um, so right now we have about 40 vacant seats that we're trying to fill. Um, so again, 650 is kind of what we plan for, but if at any time you counted heartbeats, it would be a little bit, it'd be uh, lower. Um, but the interesting thing about that number is it's about almost half of where we were in the 90s. Um, so we were up around 12 or 1300 employees uh, back in the mid 90s. And so we've cut that through efficiency and through automation and through improving our processes. Um, we have not issued pink slips. We uh, that has all been through attrition, any of those changes. Um, and anytime we do have attrition, even today, we do think about is, do we automatically want to backfill that? Or is this an opportunity for us to uh, re, uh, rebalance our workforce and put it where we need the resources the most? Is that also because of closing down of some even plants don't so we from have the not, mid 90s you said uh, 1200 i think we've closed one since the 90s we've so always, it always is had strictly efficient the same yeah mm -hmm. and in fact we've added one east bethel yeah uh, that came online in 2012 2013 yeah 13 14 um but it's a pretty small plant so that uses about one and a half people we also do expect a slight increase in our headcount in 2020 and beyond primarily due to the rogers plant acquisition um, as we both take over the existing plant and build the new one, we're going to need uh, to, to offer some additional uh, operating and maintenance support there. And also some of our odor control facilities that we've been building and some of our new lift stations that we've been building. Uh, we're going to need some additional resources. Some of that will be through rebalancing and some of that will be through um, uh, actual hiring. But again, it's not, it's less than 1%, 1 to 2% on the, in the total scheme of things. Uh, so now we get to our outstanding debt. Um, the most important thing here to note is we have about 1.3 billion outstanding in debt. Um, that is going to peak in 2019, actually. And then that uh, it estimated that these numbers kind of move around a bit based on um, how much of our capital we spend each year, capital plan. Um, but it will be peaking at about 1.3 billion and then coming down. So a couple of uh, key things to know. Um, uh, even though that sounds like a lot, we are actually are in the lowest quintile for debt per capita across our peer agencies. Um, so we're at about uh, in the low 200s, $200 per uh, capita in the region. Um, and that's lower than about 80% of our, of our peer agencies across the country. Um, that's primary. One of the reasons we have that uh, such low debt per capita is because we haven't had any consent decrees by the EPA. And that's because uh, in the 70s and 80s under the Clearwater Act and other, some other uh, foresight, uh, we separated our storm sewers from our wastewater sewers. Um, so a lot of the consent decrees that you're seeing today around uh, uh, Cincinnati, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Dade County, most of those are because they have combined systems. So when there's a heavy rain event, they can't treat all of their water. And so they have to discharge unprocessed, untreated water into whatever the receiving body is. Um, and it's interesting because when we go to uh, conventions and other things uh, and we tell people we treat 100% of our waste, they're quite surprised because typically people shoot for 99, 98, and they're happy when they get there. And we, we're at 100%. And again, that's because we have uh, separated systems. So if you're doing too much of that overflows, the EPA steps in and says, you need to spend 10 billion or 20 billion or 5 billion over the next five to 10 years. So that increases the debt profile of many of our peer agencies. And we are fortunate that we don't have that. Um, so our debt will peak at about 1.3 billion. We have two types of debt. 
that we use. Um, the first is our general obligation municipal bonds. So those are AAA rated and those are general obligation council bonds. They are uh, tax exempt um, because they are muni bonds. Um, and we are triple rated. That's driven by a couple of factors. One is our healthy reserve. Uh, two is the lack of volatility in our revenue stream. Um, three is we do have the authority to assess property taxes to recover any, to recover any unpaid um, sewer fees. Uh, we've never used it, and I hope we never do, um, but the, the rating agencies like the certainty of that. Um, and then they also look at the overall health of the region, and we're pretty healthy uh, regionally. We're economically a healthy region, and they do look at our debt, debt percent, as I mentioned before. Um, the other source of our funding, of our debt funding, is uh, PFA, which is the Minnesota Public Facilities Authority, and those are subsidized loans, um, and those are subsidized with federal dollars through the SRF, the State Revolving Fund, if you've heard that uh, term. Um, so the SRFs is the subsidy source, and for, uh, by the way, so our AAA bond rating is around, gives us around 3%, 3.1% uh, in our interest rate. And our PFA subsidized loans are in about 1.75%. So very, very cheap debt. Um, and we're very fortunate to have that. It'd be um, an interesting math problem to uh, work out the math on uh, if we didn't have that AAA bond rating, if we had AA, what would the increase cost be to our, our customers? Yes. I don't, I don't expect you to answer all I can all try to that do that off the top exactly. of my head, but I, I actually, I don't know what AA rating is, so I yeah. should look that up um, and, and get back to you. Um, all of our debt is 20 years is the term, and it's all fixed rate. So there are uh, floating rate tool, tools available. We choose not to do that. And there's also longer term. So you probably, some people choose 30 years. In fact, uh, if you do WIFIA through the EPA, you can do up to 30 years. And you've probably even heard of century bonds where people are issuing 100-year bonds. Um, we would like to stick with our 20-year. And, and uh, our CFO and over my dead body are two things that kind of float around. Um, so she's <laughs> not a fan of century debt. Uh, and that's fine with us. Um, and the other interesting thing to note is we don't have a bonding limit. So we have unlimited bonding authority, um, which is very fortunate for us because it lets us run as the utility needs to be run and to make sure that our capital programs are robust and are repairing and rehabilitating our system um, as needed. And we, um, that authority is helpful. I think that's all I have on that portion of debt. The third way that we fund our capital programs is through pay as you go, so pay go. And that's where we use operating funds to pay for capital improvements. So this reduces the amount of debt that we would need to borrow to pay for our capital program. Um, in 19, uh, excuse me, in 2018, we were at 9 million. In 2020, uh, excuse me, 2019, we were at 11 million. And we'd like to keep increasing that over time. Uh, every million dollars of PAYGO saves about $300,000 in interest over a 20-year bond period. Um, so it is somewhat of a savings, um, and it's uh, a good way to manage our overall debt portfolio. And then it is never a budget presentation without proudly showing that we are 40% cheaper than our peers. I don't know if anyone has mentioned that. Hopefully you've heard it about four times. You're going to hear 18 more. We are 40% cheaper than our peers. And our peers are 100, uh, 100 MGD uh, a million gallon per day or higher um, uh, utilities. Um, so we are very affordable. And I have some other notes that I can't find because that page didn't print. Awesome. Um, so that is based on our retail rate. So we do every two years, we do a survey. Uh, where we reach out to all 110 of our uh, customer communities and we ask them for a household that does 5,000 gallons um, per day, per day, per year. Per we, month. Per month, thank you. Yes, 5,000 gallons per month, what is the monthly charge? So they tell us what that would be. Now, for 55, 45 to 65% of those bills are our component, so the wholesale piece of the water treatment. But those cities, as much as we love our 600 miles of pipe, um, our municipal partners have 5,000 miles of, of service mains and 7,000 miles of service laterals. 
So we have there are 12,000 miles of pipes that need to be maintained um, by our city partners, and that is that additional fee uh, that they are charging to make sure that those pipes work. Um, and so uh, we do see this as a competitive advantage for the region. Um, this data is old. We actually have new numbers that what this again was from last year's presentation. Um, just imagine that the whole thing shifted up about 15% because uh, we're still 40% cheaper than the rest of the industry. I believe our we're going to be at about 275 per year for total retail rate, and the total uh, U.S. is up at around $500 per year for retail services. So we are very uh, competitive, um, and we also see that our industrial rates are similarly uh, very competitive. We have some of our industrial customers who are part of a nationwide system, so they know what they're paying here and they know what they're paying in Chicago. Um, they often tell us that our rates are some of the most competitive in the country. Um, and now we're going to get into SAC. Mr. Chair. Yes, I'm Adam. Just sorry, Mr. Member. Smith, but just have to point out the irony of Flushing, New York being the third highest. <laughs> Bada boom. Bada boom. Sorry. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so now we'll get into SAC. Um, the, the, if you remember nothing else about SAC, the first thing I want you to remember is call me. Um, if you hear from a constituent, and I imagine at some point you will, um, please reach out to me, and I will work with SAC staff to, to do our best to, to resolve their concern. Um, SAC is, again, sewer availability charge. It's a one-time fee for connecting to or expanding your use of the system. Um, and SAC is about the capacity that's reserved for the biggest possible day. It's not really about your average flows. So the way to think about so. One of the things that you are probably going to hear is why on earth would I pay a $10,000 bill because you're saying I'm going to use 10,000 gallons per day and I've got my water bills from the last 10 years and I've never used more than 18,000 gallons per month. And that's 18,000 gallons per month is an average flow. SAC is about being ready for the busiest day. So the way to think about that and speaking of U.S. Bank Stadium, if you looked at the pipe that's coming out of U.S. Bank Stadium right now, you probably need about a four inch pipe. There's not much coming out. It might be some now because they're cleaning up from uh, the final four. But on any given day, the amount of water coming out of US Bank Stadium could maybe fit in a six inch pipe. But think for a minute about minute two of halftime of the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. And now you need a pipe that's this big. So SAC is about reserving the capacity, not only in the pipe, but also in the plants to make sure that on any given day, the busiest day, we will have capacity to cover for that. So uh, the way we determine SAC is based on, it's based on a residential equivalent. And we have engineering studies that show us a restaurant is worth, well, it depends on the size of the restaurant, but you know, a restaurant is three times, I don't, uh, three times the flow of a house. And an office is two times the flow. And a warehouse is one, is one and a half times the flow. So we have engineering studies that break that all down. So, the, and the way it works is when a customer is ready, a business is ready to expand or remodel or build. They go to their local city first and they say, can I have a building permit? And the city says, well, this, the city could issue <clears throat> the determination, but they generally say, I won't give you a permit until you have a determination letter from the Met Council telling us how many SAC units your business owes. Um, the, the actual SAC bill itself goes to the community and then the community has the option to pass that on to the business owner or property owner. And surprisingly, they always do. Um, there are some cases where they might have some SAC units banked across the entire city, and they might choose to use those. But generally, it's a pass-through. So whatever we build a city, the city then turns around and bills that to the customer. Um, the other interesting thing to note that you might encounter uh, is local SAC and local WAC. So many of the communities build their charges on, they add on charges based on ours. So if we say 10 SAC are due and we charge $2,485 per SAC, the local community may turn around and add another three, five, even $7,000 per SAC unit on top of that to recover their capital costs for their sewer, their sewers, and also WAC, which is water availability charge, to pay for the water pipes that are coming in that building as well. So um, a lot of times when I rate customers, particularly those of you who are in some of the outer suburbs, um, the further you are from the core, the more likely you are to encounter local SAC and local WAC. 
Um, so when they say, how come Met Council sent me a bill for $100,000? A lot of times Met Council only sent a bill for seventy uh, for 25000 and the other 75000 is going to a local. So call me um, and I can help you uh, work, work through that. The great news about SAC, though, is that it's $2,485 per unit. That's not always great news, but the fact that it's been flat since 2014 is. So SAC has not increased um, since January 1 of 2014. Generally due to robust growth in the region, I'll talk through that in a second, but we, uh, for 2020, we're expecting it to remain flat. Um, and uh, based on the robust growth that we're seeing, so there was the recession, you can see where the units plummeted around, bottomed out at 2009, um, and now it's growth uh, grown. 2018 was actually a little bit down from 2017, but considering 2017 was 25% more than 2016, uh, we think that's pretty healthy. Um, so very healthy, robust growth in the region. A lot of that's driven by apartments, um, but it's also driven by local businesses. Um, <clears throat> we do expect growth to slow a little bit in 2019. That's just me with my pessimist hat on. Um, this is the largest economic expansion in the history of the United States. So at some point it's gotta slow down. Um, but that, that slowdown could cause an increase in 2022 or 2023. We'll have to see how the units flow. But the important thing to note is that that robust growth right now is uh, causing our reserve to grow. Uh, you can see here, this reserve is 87 million at the end of 2018. I think we ended closer to 89 million for the end of 2018. Um, the orange line represents what our, our reserve, uh, SAC res uh, the reserve has to be. And it's generally, it's a five-year average of SAC payments. Um, so we are well above our our reserve uh, policy, um, but you can also see from 2002, 2003 down to 2006, how quickly it can plummet during a recession. Um, so we have a healthy SAC fund. The other thing we can do is during a recession, if the units slow down, uh, we can tap into the reserve to keep the rates flat rather than increasing to compensate for the decreased uh, activity. The rate schedule here is not so much important to know about the dates. It's important to know that we are always talking to our customers to find out <clears throat> how we can better meet their needs and particularly getting their input on our budgets so that it's not just us handing the rates down to them, but figuring out if there's tweaks we need to meet, take to better meet their needs. It's a very interactive and iterative process, um, starting with our industrial customers. We've already done our liquid waste hauler. Uh, in March, and we have our ne two next industrial forums coming uh, next week and the week after, um, where we can present our rates to them. They have actually, especially in industrial weights, uh, as we have phased in some expenses, we've asked their feedback on how long do you wanna take? Do you wanna take three years? Do you wanna take five years? Um, if there's additional expenses we need to recover, we don't just immediately plow it in. We did actually the same thing happened with the brewery charges. Um, we rolled it out, uh, and in fact, we, we rolled it out at an industrial forum and we said we'd like to collect, collect this for the second half of the year. So this was in March, April timeframe. We said we'd like to start collecting this in July. And the brewers said we, we didn't build that into our budgets. So that really doesn't work for us. And we said, okay, how about if we start collecting in January? And they said, yes, that works better because now I can plan for that and I can bake that into my prices. So we took the feedback and we were able to push that expense out and push the, the collection of that expense out. So we do our best to hear from our customers what's important to them and adjust our actions accordingly. Um, with that, I do just wanna wrap up. If you remember only six things, <laughs> we are fee for service. We have no outside funding and we do not fund other parts of the council. Our rates are 40% lower. We are allocated, we are not cost per gallon received, and it is, uh, which reduces our volatility in revenue collection and billing. SAC is a large revenue source and it's about capacity, not flow. And if anyone calls you about SAC, please call me. Um, and we have a robust capital program uh, where we are uh, robustly investing in the rehabilitation of our system. And again, our, our debt is 20 years and it's fixed. And with that, I'll stand for any other questions. Any other mm -hmm. questions? Fantastic presentation. Appreciate it. Outstanding. Thank you. Thanks again. All right. All right. That takes us to general manager's report.
have you got for us today? Well, um, hopefully I'm going to keep checking in and you'll tell me that you're learning fast enough because we don't want to hit you with too much. So we're trying to deliver things just kind of just in time. Mm -hmm. And so we're heading into the finance, um, heaviest finance portion of our year with our budget setting and all our meetings. So that's why we caught you with that today. The only other thing I have to add today is the present, the first info item uh, with the award, the Better Government Award. Also, um, they forgot to mention, which I think is a really big deal, the National Association of Clean Water Agencies does a um, quarterly publication that's a national mm -hmm. publication, and they've featured that story of the work that we've done with our recruitment efforts so that other utilities could learn from that and apply some of that. I just was at um, the water policy fly-in last week in D.C. where um, a lot of the water agencies, not just NACWA, but WEF and, and uh, other water organizations, there's a wastewater reuse organization, they're all meeting with legislators trying to get them to think about dollars they could put towards uh, water infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, we're in a little better shape, particularly in this region, because you've heard we invest, mm -hmm. reinvest in our infrastructure, but there's places where the dollars just aren't there and they do need their water infrastructure taken care of, so it's one of those challenges that that our uh, policymakers, both here at the state and at the national level, are struggling a bit with. Would um, it be possible to send that NACWA uh, report out? Absolutely. It hasn't been done already? It will do that. So it's was, it was great because I got asked some questions and people were interested in talking about that. It's a little bit different than the traditional approach and they recognizing the need to do some similar things. Mm -hmm. So we really try and learn from our peers as much as we can, and they like to hear what we're doing that's differently, particularly when we talk about our rates, how come our rates are what they are, or how we're doing SAC. Um, Michigan, with their bankruptcy, are, are setting up a new regional form of water. And uh, Kyle presented to them, I think about six months ago, they were invited to to come and because they were looking at how they're going to set up their financial structure and they were very very interested in what we were doing and he had lots of questions for him and then the middle of may i've been asked to come and present they're doing a focus on asset management but they also want to hear about collaboration and they said come talk to us about that we hear you guys mm -hmm. like to do that in minnesota so i'm going to be doing an exchange with them and that in may great So, Mr. Chair, committee members, I just wanted to let you know that I'll have the link for the article in the minutes reflected, and I will make sure that we email that out to you after the meeting concludes today. Excellent. That Anything concludes else? my report. Fantastic. Great meeting, and we are adjourned. Thank you.